friends, they would not have that attitude towards their entire relation, or they wouldn't be very good friends. If they're just in it for what's in it for me, uh, if they're just uh, motivated by self-interest throughout their relation, they're not going to be really uh, good friends. But within that relation of friendship at a deeper level or a more fundamental level, they can have um, competitive interactions, yes. Um, so within these caring relations of a much more tenuous, distant kind, uh, that can form the sort of basis on which to, to have social relations at all, to have people who think of themselves as part of a society and, and they can come up with a state. There have been lots of people not influenced by the ethics of care who pointed out not just any collection of people can form a state, they have to, they have, to have some degree of social cohesion, of uh, unity as a group before they can um, formulate institutions that will constitute a state. In describing the ethics of care, you do associate it, I think, very appropriately with a uh, feminist approach. And I did think, and I'm very glad Carol was able to come today, I was thinking about it in another voice, because partly what you do is challenge the uh, both Hobbesian but also Kantian notion that we start just with individual self-interest and then try to find a way uh, through rational calculation that self-interest gives us some sort of justice, some sort of group norms, and that has been the way in which traditionally uh, both national laws and morals as well as international laws achieve by trying to show the relationship between individual interest and individual freedom and uh, the kind of rational choices when you think of others who are equally free and how it might impact on them. That's, that's how we get there. That's, that's the Kantian uh, term. Uh, that is so effective, it's, it's, but it's rooted in individualism, in interest, and in rationality. And I think when you appeal to care, uh, when feminists appeal to care, they're not just talking about care itself, but they're talking about a way of thinking that doesn't necessarily start with us as atomized individuals, but as relational beings embedded in communities and families. The problem with care is it seems, at least on its face, to uh, have a narrower Compass, and you, it's interesting. You talk about groups, and because of what's going on in the Middle East and Libya right now, I was thinking about, oh, you know, I can think of a place right now where there's a real care ethic that's overriding everything else. I mean, this is just absurd, but I think actually, from what I know, it's real. The Qaddafi clan, you know, they're hunkering down together. They care deeply about each other. They're rejecting uh, every other person, but the, it's a very strong group norm. That's an exaggerated view of what one might call the impossible parochialism of care that we feel care strongly in the family, in the clan, in the tribe, as it gets more distant, it's hard for that affect to have the same international and globalizing effect that the projection of rational self-interest does. What shifts the paradigm that care rests on, why care was, in my view, a different voice, not just another voice within the old paradigm, but a different voice, is it starts with a premise of interdependence. So it's you know, exactly you know, aligned with the idea of interdependence. Now, I just want to make two or three comments in passing and then see if this would help the discussion. The first is that in the liberal state, <clears throat> one reason that caring was more or less invisible is that the people who did the caring were invisible. They were without voices. They had no public representation. They were women and the poor, basically. So the liberation of women brought to the general public political arena questions that had been remarkably absent, which is, does anybody care? Because if not, I mean, the sort of extreme position is, we're not going to do it if nobody cares. And if we're going to do it, we're going to raise these issues on a societal, political, global, economic level. I think that uh, one has to say that uh, care and justice are not opposed values. And the individual considered as a right-bearing individual and the individual as a subject of care are not opposed values. There is absolutely no need as modern individuals and also as modern men and women, for us to so segregate and segment ourselves also um, 
you know, to say one gender is associated with one point of view, which you are not absolutely doing. But um, I also am not ready to give up the language of rights and the language of politics. I consider that you know, fundamental achievements of modernity. So whatever feminism we have has to be you know, a feminism that is also true to those achievements. But I'm not either. And, um, um, this whole paper is on international law. It's right. hardly right. talked about at all. <laughs> Human rights are part of that. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we can substitute um, th this um, this point of view of care or something like the respect for rights, but I am trying to deal with the problem. What are the implications and how do they fit together? In what I see in your work, this what I have read, which is opening up a problematic, not solving it, let's put it that way. But w one way of thinking about it is opening conceptual ground or, or undisciplined ground to a disciplining, you know, because that comes back to the ethics. So it's not just the action of caring, it is actually finding a norm of sorts, right? Now, I, and it resonates with, with the work that I'm doing, which has to do with, with uh, uh, systems where the question of care doesn't appear. But I think there is a kind of a structural resonance between what you're saying and what I'm after. So for instance, in the environmental question, I mean, one way of putting it very succinctly is this rupture that we keep making, where the biosphere keeps circulating. Now we can think of this rupture as an, you know, a, a, a cutting out of this caring norm. You know, so we restrict it just to the family or whatever, rather than trying to expand it globally or whatever it might be, or to other domains. People are, are um, uh, suffering environmental damages, or uh, there are not going to be uh, uh, things that people need uh, available to them, that kind of thing. So you can interpret them in terms of care, uh, or, I mean, other language could be used, but it's certainly compatible with uh, the values of care. If what we really want to do is prevent violent conflict, we, 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 we uh, could benefit from approaching it as a problem in public health and doing empirical research to discover the etiology of suicide, homicide, accidents, and warfare, and uh, attempting to do more than just care for the victims, but I'd say something that goes deeper than care, and that is prevention. That is preventing people from being injured in the first place so that they don't need medical care. Um, and uh, that that is not a, uh, I mean, that's, of course, an enterprise based on moral norms. That is on the norm that we place a positive value on human life and that we place a positive value on protecting people from death that's avoidable. Um, but it can proceed in a, in a much more empirical manner uh, and is not simply a question of kind of how should people live together, but rather how can people live together. That is what principles and policies, uh, uh, social and psychological, sustain life and which ones lead to death. So far, what I've heard sort of the conversation being about are three entities, feminism, care, and interdependence. And it seems to me that these all have a common problem. And I would put it in the form of a question what the problem is. Carol, you said it's a paradigm shift, and I totally agree with this fact. But how does one accomplish a paradigm shift? I mean, how do you do that? Um, you know, I mean, I think this is a problem inherent, con a continuing problem in feminism. It's an inherent problem in the interdependence movement, and it's obviously a problem uh, in this question of the ethics of care and responsibility. In terms of care, all I, all I can come up with or came up with was um, that there would not be necessarily any kind of description that the, even the people around this room would all agree to that has to do with care. 
because it's um, an experiential response and it's also an emotional response. And so you've got those two things side by side. And then I look at, um, in order to get to this more, I, frankly, idealistic world that I believe Virginia has described, then I have to take the issue of care and I think the assumption she made that we, that we, that we have an experience of growing up with people who cared about us and we experience that issue of care. And um, my concern is that there are a lot of people who haven't. And even those, that, and it's very likely that those people aren't going to be the ones who are going to be engendering this leadership role that exudes care. Uh, as Ben was pointing out, one of the very important aspects of uh, what's going on in the Middle East is the degree of nonviolence that's, uh, yeah. that's, so that's um, sort of coloring what's happening. And it seems to me that that's a very hopeful development, that um, for the U.S. to uh, push hard that these governments um, uh, you have a lot of restraint and allow for peaceful demonstrations without shooting people, um, if that becomes um, more the standard practice, you could avoid quite a lot of the violence that has occurred. Um, and um, when you say the violent conflict is sort of more, in, 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 interstate violence is maybe um, more a thing in the past, um, the U.S. invasion of Iraq was not that long ago, and an awful lot of people got killed. And so it's, it's importantly in my mind when I um, I'm trying to write about these things. It could easily happen again, it seems to me. Um, and to, to Leah's point about uh, whether power, whether you use power to um, bring about this change or you can use uh, uh, something like um, practices of care to try to influence power. I like the, the way Stuart put it, that it's, it, it's not one or the other. They, they can reinforce one another. Um, and um, I think a certain amount of, of um, change has occurred in recognizing some of the um, considerations that an ethic of care would bring to the fore. Uh, I think one of the great advantages of the ethics of care is that it does not um, invoke religion, require religion. Um, everybody has experienced care. Everybody can get reflective about the values inherent in caring practices. Everybody needs care and um, can see that from a moral point of view, uh, there ought to be care for those who need it. And uh, you, can, you can get something like um, human rights out of this, that everybody, every child that needs care ought to get it. And that can go quite a long way towards um, um, providing at least recommendations about how to deal with uh, some problems that the world is facing. How do you get there? Well. Um, that would be a long answer. Yeah. What? Or we all have to say. Or a very short answer. Or a very short one, right. Um, it's a problem. Well, why uh, don't we uh, tell people that Virginia... Well, thank you. Yeah.